So good evening, everyone. Well, welcome to today's Friday Next. Uh, today we are very excited because we got this screen here. <laughs> and then, uh, but more excitingly, uh, we managed. Uh, we are inviting Sri Ram to talk about his research in abusing sensor data. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if you figure out how this film like system works, but hold on. Yes, yes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for coming. I know it's a Friday night, but I also know that's how hackers work, so we we find out for this. Um, you're all about the signals for being here, but then abusing sensor data. I think that's it. Fair to say, this is again and you have it. So, well, I'm Sri Ram. I will talk to you about whatever this is for the next. Let's say 30 odd minutes. And uh, feel free to interrupt me after they ask me anything. This is a weird topic, so I do appreciate it. Okay, so in 2017, I did my first US hack. Um, this was Friday Hacks 136, and 2.37 now, so it's been like five years. So back in that time, I was doing autopilot stuff, you know, drones and shit. And uh, well, I did one more the same year again, drones and shit. As you can see very popular toy. So well, what happened since then? Uh, 2019, I graduated. Wow. I was like, well, what do I do with my life? Do I go get a real job? You know, earn some actual money, get actual help with this? No. Of course, the most logical thing to do is get a PhD and pressure. That is, of course, uh, the, the necessary fear at the time. The PhD is going to do it for the other thing. So, the question is, well, if you're a bad generous and you, and you work with electronics and hardware badly in the tree, uh, and you're also not good at math, you didn't do CS well, how do you do a PhD? And when I think about a bad generalist, I, I mean that, right? Uh, I have cracked more drones than you can imagine, there's two of them, and there's also two more here which cracked in, again, very amazing math. Uh, it's lost a lot of money. Um, but yeah, how do you, with a terrible background in hardware and a terrible background in CS, do a PhD? Uh, well, the answer is that why don't you go and break shit for a living? Right? If you do that anyway, why don't you make that your job? Right? So that, that is what I do. So then the question comes well, what is the research space of creating shit for a living? Well, that doesn't really exist, right? I mean, people who basically get math and like databases and stuff. What do you really do? Um, you have to ask the question where you find the things that you can break, you know, to get a living. And the answer to that is, well, surprisingly, almost every single thing in the world is not a possible effect, but they become incredibly cheap, right? This is just your goal. Yeah, it's just your goal, right? And maybe like, I don't know, 20 cents at this point, more or less than here. And also, not just that, right? There are like two centers in your robot, they have the dome and whatnot. And so you can have that just anyway. So, okay, given that, I want to raise one thing, maybe hopefully, this is going to be one thing to just talk. Just remember this, okay? Every single sensor that you can think of is probably over there. I'll explain that in a second. And the second thing is, well, once you know that, you can apply that for your own key profit, whatever you want to do. Okay? So, what, what do I mean? Um, what is a sensor? Right? This is just the copy paste from some generic website definition of a sensor. And then it's here for a reason, right? They say something about detecting like changes in the environment and they have a bunch of stuff. This makes it seem like a sensor is. Only doing what it's supposed to do at the end of the day. You know, it's, a, it's a purpose design thing. And that's not true. Okay? What a sensor really is, is a thing that exploits some law of physics, measures some relevant information. Right? What do I mean by that? What I mean is that imagine, imagine one of those laser distance sensors, a LIDAR, right? like a robot vacuum cleaner, just an example right now. And what it's doing is it's exploiting some law of physics. Right? It's trying to figure out how far away something is. And how it does that is it takes you know, the speed of light. Divided by, uh, or multiplied by how long the laser went up and came back, divided by two. Right? Very, very simple, sort of like you know, measuring distance from A to B. Right? But that's not very interesting. That would be very boring with that small we did with the sensor. Right? Uh, but the nice, here's the kicker. Right? Whatever sensor you have is forced to obey all laws of physics, not just the ones that are conveniently there for the sensor. Right? And a nice sort of law that you can also follow is that, well, the brightness that the sensor receives, the light sensor, is affected by like you know the angle at which the PC shot it, right? So imagine that object is like vibrating a little bit you know, for some reason. Talk about it. Now you would get a signal, right? a changing signal, no longer a static, right? So just think about it this way, right? 
Try to focus everything in this. That physics, make sure that any sensor that you have will have more data than you immediately intend. Okay? Keep that principle in mind. Now we're going to abuse the heck out of this. Okay, this is the, the core principle that we take on each other. So, how can we exploit this movement that we're talking about? I'm just going to show you a couple of things that people have done as actual research to do this with their real time and money that I enjoy. Uh, let's look at one. Okay? On your phone and many other devices, there's an accelerometer. Right? And all that does is it measures vibration or acceleration in multiple dimensions. Okay? Not a particularly interesting sensor, you know, behind your phone, like your phone phone, or stuff like that. Right? So the original goal of this sensor is to send vibration. Right? So something is vibrating, you know, the internal sensor vibrates, it produces some sort of thing that's proportional to that vibration. Right? And all the accelerometers measure acceleration. Okay, so that's boring. What can we actually do? Okay. What else is vibration? Right? This comes to the core of all these papers, right? Speech is also vibration, right? Not just you shaking a phone around. Speech is vibration, right? So imagine if you speak near an exorbitant, well, that also becomes a signal, right? That's also vibration. So what does that mean? What can you actually do with something like this? Well, what happened was that, uh, this is from my PhD supervisor, um, he realized that you could do an attack like this. So, Every phone has an accelerometer, which is not that great, right? It doesn't do, it can't, you know, send, you know, uh, you know the, to the extent of speech. But what you can do is, uh, you can access it for free without, instead of your microphone. And if you use your microphone on your phone, you know, Android pops up a thing saying, oh, do you want to let me have access to your microphone, right? You're like, ah, I obviously didn't want this, so you say no, right? But if you access your accelerometer, the vibration sensor, that's perfectly fine. The user doesn't know, no pop up exists, and that's it, right? You can use it for free with an app is on. Think about that for a second. It's very brief. Imagine uh, no, not funny fingers. I don't know, grab, GBS, uh, uh, whatever, right? Imagine they decided one day, I just want to record all the vibration in my phone. They can do that. Never know. Right? So, what you could do is that imagine if all of us here just put our phones on the table. Oh, look, we all did that already. Hmm. Right? We left it on the table. What we could do is that we could intelligently, as an attacker, combine all those vibration signals together. Right? And in the end, you could recover speech. This is a known thing. Right? So one phone can't do it, but if you have multiple phones, you just put them together and that's speech. So that is one big idea this oversight there, right? So one sensor sends more than you. If you have many sensors, you can send well, you can order the magnitude more than before. Okay. So this is the research paper. You can look at it if you want for the slides. So there are many, many such papers like this. This is just this is just one. For example, right? You can tell um, the, the research papers now show that you can tell exactly where you're traveling. With your barometer sensor, which is your pressure sensor on your phone. Again, same concept, right? There is no permission involved. Again, you open, I just you know, read on Kayla for a bit. You know, again, I don't I like that. It's just you know, good target. You open Kayla, Kayla decides on day, I want to record all of your pressure, like barometer information, basically just like how much air pressure there is. If you just walk around Singapore for a while, you just take a bus or something, in about, let's say, 15, 20 minutes, they can figure out where you are, right? Because, you know, the world is elevation, up hills, down hills, things like that. And you walk on and up, you can figure out where you are. Right? Because the, the, the you know profile of where you walk is enough. You get on a bus, you also know that. Right? But the whole thing, oh, this is the pressure changes. You're like, oh, you're on a bus. Right? This is the kind of freaky stuff that people do again if they are like genuine work time, you know, with their own money. Okay, it's also a thing. And I'm not sure if the guy is there. Okay, well, one of my uh, one of our colleagues, um, his thing is, you know, well. We can do something useful. We don't have to just be a be an asshole and attack everything you know, 24 7. Right? We go in his work, figure out whether, you know, let's say someone sold you a fake bottle of like olive oil, like alcohol or something. Just like spinning it around, and you point your phone camera at it, and by just looking how the bubbles right through the, the you know, the liquid part of it, you can tell whether it's green or fake. Right? There's all like weird sci fi stuff that comes out of the fact that you can have few centers for whatever like end you want, because they send far more than you expect. So that's just the idea. It's the idea of over the years. So, uh, that's other people's work, uh, and I don't even it for them. So, what we'll talk about is well, what I do, right? which is uh, all about light based sensing and the two different types of analytics. Okay? So, really quickly, why do I focus specifically on light sensing? Right? The first thing is that they're really popular now. Right? They're on like robot vacuum cleaners, they're on like, self driving cars, whatnot. You see them. Right? Delivery robots, all different lighters. Probably one here, someone in this candy has a lighter as well. Speedy bus, there's somewhere in the corner. Never does a job as well. So yeah, they have uh, you know, minor sensors. I'm also very good at exploring. There's a whole bunch of research papers that we are usual guys doing deep learning with the LIDAR and finding whether it's a human or a trash can or something. So we don't care about that. 
right? You want to put something deeper, you want to center itself. So still, there's some space. And lastly, the interesting, interesting kind of medium, because when it hits a wall, it gives the user that you know, the, the, all the lights scattered in like all directions, because the mirror comes back in one direction, things like that, right? You need, we do care about light. So, but then what are the two sides of problem? Right? Why are the two sides of sense? First side is that, well, you can create privacy problems for anyone you care about, right? That's really scary. That's the first side. And the other side that you saw right, is that you could make something useful right, out of that. And I'll explain these papers in a second, but I'll just quickly talk about them first. Right? So how do we use sensors that sense more than expected to do scary things? Right? This is my own kind of scary thing. So um, this is about spying with robot vacuum cleaners. Uh, I'm going to point out the Sean over there who also did this paper, so you can go and follow him about it later as well, not just me. And you don't need here, okay? so you can, you can follow him about it more. Okay, so we did this a couple of years ago, and this is the idea. Right? Again, like I mentioned, there's self driving cars, there's robots, robots, and robot vacuum cleaners. Right? This is the actual one of my house. Though. So, all of these memoirs, right, distant sensors, right, and you'll see more and more of them as we go to self driving cars. So, why is it so important? Well, let's talk specifically about vacuum cleaners. Let's look at an example. Okay, the idea of this paper is this we're going to curve your vacuum cleaner that has no microphone on it at this point in time into something that has a microphone. We're going to use that little like, laser sensor on your Vacuum cleaner as the source. Okay, so simple idea. Turn laser sensor into micro. That's the idea. Okay, lots of issues with this. Spinning laser sensor, lots of problems. We'll try and fix that one more. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do rationally is borrow technology from the Russians. Right? I say that genuinely. This is 1970s Russian technology that you've been in the Cold War. It's a laser micro. Right? What's the idea behind that? Okay, if you sign a laser at some sort of object, okay, now it's usually a mirror for the sake of argument. Right? If there's no sound near the object, the object just stays there, right? And you get a reflection from that. But as I showed a little bit earlier, if an object is vibrating here, of course, you know, exaggerated for the sake of the talk, right? If you have a vibrating object near a laser source, you get a signal, right? If you look at the laser source, you get different amounts of light back and forth. So it's a really elegant idea to get Russian straight on. I did this. So what can we do? So the idea of light of one of is basically this. Right? We're going to make a remote, so the hacker is going to be there, stealthy, nobody knows about it, and scalable means it applies to like a whole bunch of devices, let's say vacuum cleaners, each of them. Here's what we're going to do. Okay? If you're sitting at home with Zoom or something and it's playing to your speakers, right? imagine you're going to have a trash can or something next to it. Okay? What do you do with that? With your little like, robot vacuum cleaner, we hack into it, right? we take over its LiDAR and its processing like stack, and we take that laser signal and we send that to some like server. The server takes the whole signal, processes all, processes all of it, and out comes some digits. You know, let's say credit card numbers or pin codes or something like that. Just from the little like you know, uh, speaker that's putting out information. That's the overall idea behind this. Okay. The so nice thing, of course, about these things is that it sounds very easy to do, but it never really is. So if it's hackers, I'll show you some technical information. You can make your own decisions. Okay. So here's the core details. How the hell do you hack a robot vacuum cleaner and make it do what you want? Okay. Step one. So you can send my email. Uh, so, MIT, some guys a while ago came up with a hack that you can basically, over the air, you can upload your own custom firmware to the uh, robot vacuum cleaner, the Xiaomi Overall S5, and you can basically get full access to the vacuum cleaner. And it's quite beautiful. The whole thing, you know, the steps I'm not really going to get into because I didn't make this hack, but long story short, they find out there's some sort of like fixed encryption key inside, they manage to extract it, they use that to sort of uh, intercept the, the like, uh, firmware update, and they push a new like, custom uh, ROM set to your it's very fun. I don't know the video here, but I made it play Star Wars and more on it. So, see, it's really fun. So, uh, I, I love it. Too. Okay, so now step one is done. So, you have full boot access to vacuum cleaner. What do you do? Okay, here's the second thing you're going to do. Unfortunately, right, vacuum cleaners are these lighters a little bit safe, right? If you try to stop them from spitting, so I can collect data for the experiment, um, they will turn off the laser because I eye safety and jump safety things like that, right? Because they don't want a laser shining in your eyes, you know, you become blind. I obviously don't care about this, and I don't care about my safety. So the, the obvious option here is to turn off all the safety, uh, uh, you know, the enemies. And the only way to do that, unfortunately, was to basically plug in an Arduino with a whole like signal generator and basically pull the whole lighter. You'll see it here. It basically like plugged into like some kind of you know a random pin in the, the lighter, and it spoofs it and tells it, hey, active lighter is leaking, so you keep firing at least. Oh, is there anything else you care? And that's step two. Okay, so we break the lighter, we convince it that it's still spinning, so keep firing at the and step three is that, okay, we have a whole bunch of OS stuff, I don't want to get into it. Uh, and we basically, you know, bypass the whole like USB or stack element. 
Um, and we get out a statement. Right? And if the sound is played, you have a signal from, from some uh, from the, the lighter itself. We pre-process it, but the signal processing happens, clean up the noise, with noise removal, filters, so on and so forth. We do again magic machine learning, like, you don't know about it, right? Fortunately, we need to use this, but we are all we are all you know, simple people. Um, and then it brings something, then I send the blow one, you send like you know, three digits or something. And that is uh, long story short, what this paper does. Okay. So I want to show you, of course, like what it looks like genuinely when you, when you run this, right? Um, and let me let me just go. Okay. I think the sound might be. So again, this is in MR3 or something. Um, we hit something, uh, just keep going. What we're doing is we're playing some music. Okay. That is a signal from the laser. It is not a microphone, right? So it's playing a signal there on that speaker, then it's playing it on the thing. Right. So these are signals coming up from the laser itself, not a microphone. Right. And what you can tell from there is well. Essentially, it seems like I have on the microphone. And that is the fundamental concept of this whole thing. So, yeah, and I was just going to play some music or something in the background, and all these are basically just kept on. Okay, so that's the idea, that was the concept. Okay, so what does this mean? The takeaway from this is simple, and it will be the same takeaway for everything else, right? We can use the, the tiniest bit of information, like the tiniest bit, right? Like the drag of information, like, you know, we're talking like, I don't know, small sampling rate. Uh, you know, very, very low resolution, lots of noise, right? And even with that tiny bit of information, we can extract that. Okay. For example, this is the digit seven. Okay, I'm going to play it loud. Okay. Play it through the, the, the laser. This is what the laser microphone, so to speak, on the robot here when we say seven. Okay. That's it. This is eight. Okay. Try to make sense of it. You can maybe barely, barely hear it. Barely, right? I'll say it again. Okay, here's seven. Okay, here's eight. Okay, maybe if you knew what the labels are, you could figure it out, right? But in a genuine scenario, there is no way you would know. Right? So again, we have used the magic machine that to figure it out. Okay, that's the thing. Okay, we can take any bit of information, do something useful. Okay, part two. Okay, let's stop doing bad things. Okay, let's try and do something useful, right? So here's the useful thing we can do. Again, two sides of sensor, right? The useful thing is this we're going to try and find hidden cameras using some similar concepts to this. Hidden camera, if you don't like it. Okay, so here's a quick question. Okay, here's three objects. Okay, water bottle, watch, Wi Fi router. Okay, anyone want to guess in the directive part where is the hidden camera? Any idea? Hmm? What's it? Oh, uh, the first answer is it's all three of them. Okay, all three of them have graphic cameras, but can you find out where it is? Yeah, probably not. Also, it's not the point of this, right? Okay, here's the answer. Okay, water bottle. Uh, is in there. The tiny little camera is sent to the bottom. By the way, you can buy this. You'll see in a second. All right? Watch. Okay, there. The tiny little bottom of the watch, you can find a living camera. Last one, Wi Fi router. Yeah, it's on. It's on. It's responsible. Um, it's in that little like, hole in the bottom. You will never find it. Right? There are like, so many holes. Each one will have a living camera. You have no idea. All right? So, the, the scary part about this is that you can buy all this online. Again, sorry, in Lazada or Shopee or whatever. Oh, I know. Sorry. Uh, not, not, not specific. You can get it from anywhere. Right? Uh, no, no hate. Uh, but yeah, see the bottle is like what 15 bucks, the watch is like 25 bucks, and then like the last one you can just DIY it for like 30 cents. Okay, this is scary, this genuinely happens, this will happen today. Okay, um, so yeah, we need a way to sort of you know defeat this, right? It's so easy to make, right? It's so hard to find. So you guys couldn't find it sitting here as well, right? Nobody can. So here's the idea. Okay, imagine, imagine I'm standing in front of some sort of shelf, right? I want to find I have a suspicion, I maybe I think this water bottle is a hidden camera. The idea is this: take out my phone, right? The phone basically tells me there's a hidden camera by shining a laser at it, getting a reflection. And if it's a very bright reflection, maybe that's a hidden camera. Okay, that's the DLDR. It's a very, you know, it's a lot of serious steps here, but that's the, the core fundamental idea. If you find shiny things, those might be hidden cameras. Okay, again, pretty similar concept. I already, I already get lasers and light but that's just because they have some light problems. Okay, so what's the background here, right? So you'll see a number of smartphones that have time reflections. Right? So S20 plus, you know, there's some Apple phones that have it as well. Right? Why? Right? Because you want to play Pokemon Go. So they're like, okay, everybody wants to play Pokemon Go, we'll make the experience nicer for you. So put in a depth sensor, right? In your phone. Right? Or you can use it to like measure things, you know, how augmented we are. Right? So some of your phones may have this sensor today. So uh, the whole point of this sensor is that it measures distance, right? From some A to B. Right? So imagine if this is the, the water bottle or something that you're looking at. Um, what you can do is that you can turn on the camera and it'll give you an image like this. Right, where darker means it's closer to you, and then you know wider means it's closer, away. right? Something like that. Okay. So how is this useful? How is this useful at all? Right. These are the inputs. 
Now, if you actually look at this, I'll show you in a second. If you look very closely at the data coming out of the APIs of Android and Apple and whatnot, you'll actually find out that they don't just give you get. They also give you like a debug information that tells you how bright the limit still is, right? They won't give you much info, you'll see in a second, right? But it's a tiny, tiny thread of information for every pixel how bright it is, right? And what that means is that we can potentially find out things that are highly reflective, right? And one of the things that are highly reflective are cameras, right? We find a uh, light in a camera, you'll find that it can directly back to very, very bright. It's kind of similar to like a cat's eye. You find a light in a cat, and the light will stay back to the sky. It looks like a crazy glowing eye, right? Retro effect. That's the effect here. But the problem here is this right? there are lots and lots of very bright things in the environment, but not all of them are hidden cameras. In fact, most of them are not hidden cameras. So how on earth do you find a hidden camera from a whole bunch of like images with a tiny like black spot? Okay, this is the problem. Now remember, the first thing here is that every single image you get from this camera, every pixel looks like this, right? There are 16 bits, right? And the last 13 bits, okay, do the thing that the camera is supposed to do, which is give you depth information, right? It tells you how far away every pixel is. Great, very useful to everyone else, almost useless to us, right? We don't care how far it is, we care how bright the spectrum is, right? So the last three bits, unfortunately, is all we have. You have three bits of information. Okay? Maybe a lot of people bytes and stuff, right? No, there's no like not even a byte of the information. Pixel is three bits. Three bits, and you might know it's about three, eight, basically a zero to seven. That's the max range you have for this, right? What the hell can you do with three bits for pixel? Right? Also, the other thing I'm not mentioning here is that each of these images are generating the resolution from the camera. It's three twenty by two forty image from the camera, and each of them is like three bits, right? So how do you Good. Again, very hard to answer in a general sense. It's a lot, a lot of steps. I'm not really going to go through it. Please feel asking me. I don't know. Don't burn your time. Long story short, we do a lot of stuff to figure out how far to land from the camera. We figure out like a 3D way to scan the entire region around the camera. We like find a lot of shiny regions and then we like filter out stuff that isn't shiny enough. We look at like the shape of the, 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 the shiny bits and stuff like that. There's all kinds of deep learning involved as well. As usual, I'm going to wait for it as much as I try. Um, and the final decision at the end of the day is, is this like shiny thing on the camera, is that a hidden camera? Right, you can see an example of it here. The left is me sort of going around like a, a, a little like shelf. Again, we fill this with lots of horrible little devices with hidden cameras, like maybe like kind of 30 inside the screen, right? Uh, you know, maybe four of these we bought online. The other rest of it, again, we built. Sean is there, you can him. He's a little sickle. He built like another 20 of these things just at his own spare time, right? And we just put them on a shelf and we try to find out which one of these hidden cameras. Right? And the, the idea behind this is that as we move around, we gain more and more confidence to something with a hidden camera. You can see the right side image, right? I'll get more debug like, information here, but you can see that the big sort of blue ball in the center is where the camera is. And all the little like rays coming out are all the little spaces where we saw something that looks like a hidden camera. And over time, we kind of slowly gain confidence to this thing the camera, and that's the, the sort of the decision making process. Okay? So that is basically our little hidden camera detection idea. So, Again, the final takeaway here is the same as before. Okay? Every sensor has a whole bunch of information, right? Some of it relevant to you, some of it not, right? But a lot of it can be used for something that you didn't expect, right? And with modern machine learning stuff, again, I hate to sort of you know propagate the idea that ML is solution for all problems, but sensing related stuff where we have so little information and so many hard decisions to make, it is quite useful, right? So that's the idea. Hope you sort of keep this uh, in mind. The conclusion is this right? again, almost every sensor has a lot of data. Go out, grab a center, take one that we have at home. And I can almost promise you, sorry, again, this image you know, on a very big screen is not very high res, uh, but you can probably find something that you can do maliciously or otherwise with that center that you didn't expect, right? There's probably a paper for every sensor that you see here. Uh, maybe not, if there isn't, then you know, maybe you can go do something new. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and do that. And yeah, that's all I have. Hope you sort of found that useful. Uh, if not, you know, thank you very much. <laughs> So thanks for the talk. Uh, now we'll move on to our Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. The shelf today. There. Oh, okay. What is the sampling frequency of a LiDAR sensor? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, uh, the question is, what is the sampling frequency of a LiDAR sensor? Okay, well, that's what backup slides are for. Uh, let me go to the right one, which is here. Okay, here's the problem. Right? Um, a LiDAR only samples, let's see where it is, five times a second. Okay, it repeats five times a second. Again, very sad. Five times a second, incredible data. Right? Um, but a, so that means a single point in the space, right? And the divider will take, goes in five times a second. 
100, right? So that means that you know you need 5,000 times a second to, to hear something useful, right? So five is not equal to 5,000. So here's what we do, right? Like we said before, we have to stop the lineup and extract. When it's collecting data, the lineup is forced to stop for a period of time. Um, and then once you do that, you can do enough of this, you can get out of 1,800 hertz. You need 5,000 to hear like sound clearly. 1,800 hertz is like, you know, on the way there. Yeah. So long as you have 5,000, you bring up 1,800 hertz. Okay. Then that gives you enough information to make it useful. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about uh, the uh, accelerometer? What does it sound like? Okay. Yeah. You also mentioned the yes. Yes, let me go and look at that. So you mentioned the okay. The question was, well, what's the sampling rate of the accelerometer, right? You mentioned earlier on that we have this whole idea, or I think there was this whole paper uh, where we attempted to merge a bunch of not we, the advisor attempted to merge a bunch of accelerometers together and then get you, you know, a, a region of it, right? So accelerometer maximum using it so all like two hundred hertz, under two hundred, you won't really get much more than that. Yeah. So that's why this is again very hard. Right? I mean, you get five thousand hertz to see only uh, hundred hundred two hundred. So this is again a very complicated game that you want to merge the system together and get you closer. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Great question. Anyone else? Anyone? Yeah, you're going to do Oh, yes. I don't think it's a hard one, but I don't know it's not. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, the way that you can do is you can do So, I expect that uh, with the right number of curves, that is, if you are better than 100 curves, you can probably uh, in mock the things, mock the line of the mechanism, and it's in front of the line of the thing. You can figure out over time if the robot goes to the outside, you know, where a fat stand is, where like, the speaker is. And once you're there, it means you can basically stop the robot and stop the other than the other. You can basically talk about the high quantum The problem here, of course, is that how do you sneak it into that little thing? So, again, you can do that. You have a hardware that's injected in that sensor. Uh, but those that might be the thing you can change the program of the company. Let's say you're selling you know, okay? so you have to do it. You know, right? Um, you know, they could change the progress of the sensor, and let's say five long So, get all of again. So, many times, okay, you don't have to your data, right? So, you just, you know, you just don't want to get out of here. Yeah, I mean, it's not that hard. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. Right? It's possible that even though the chip can be like new flats are separately by some new one that is there, it's not over the air. That's fair. Right? It's quite possible that you know, make a real estate attack like this, but over the air it means not possible. I guess maybe a better way to say is that then you know someone puts out a data that is you know, like robot essay or something, and nothing's not there for in that real object, for example, just um slashing the whole program in the library, removing the internet and then for the use. But why don't you go like you can't do over the air on this anymore for you are and you are doing this? Okay, so this is more of a manufacturer level factory side for the thing. The final is not that how this is data, someone's only interested in the a Xiaomi uh, vacuum cleaner distributor, like Google and Google, where they're going to spy the videos and they're like, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to put your data on the middle of the car. It's very scary. So, yeah, it's interesting, right? You're like, maybe Google would have made a possible sort of talking matter of facts, but maybe a new sort of uh, version of that is manufactured. Yeah. Uh, they have a speaker in front of the microphone. That's the thing that they just like, you know, they put it a second for the wire and they put the speaker in front of the microphone. Is that what you're saying? Could be. I mean, at that point, you just install a microphone. Yeah, right. Yeah, maybe it's a bit harder to do it in practice. I really hope it's hard, but I don't really want to have it. But yeah, it's a fair point. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He found them. Anyway, ask the hardest question he ever got for this video and why is it? Keep them right. Yes. Uh, I so just curious. Um, for your signal stuff, like normally when I I read the latest screen, but generally the top can get back on the mm -hmm. any like in the process that you can yeah. Yeah. yeah, big question. Let me show you. So the question was basically if you shine a little bit of something, you get something. That signal is incredibly noisy, right? Like there's any anything from the environment, the tiniest things can mess it up. Oh, okay. Um, so the question is, what do we do? What do we try and do to fix that problem? Let me show you here, right? So, okay. So what we do is, uh, the question is, what is supposed to look like? Look what the original mic recording is supposed to look like for some signal, right? This is what we get from the, the line, right? This is, if you're not familiar with this, is the frequency uh, thing on the y axis, I'm on the x axis. And then how wide it is basically how significant that frequency is at that point. And so here you can just see a whole bunch of noise here. First thing you do is you need to do a whole bunch of filtering, right? Um, I, I mean, get, it depends on how much detail you want to get in later. But basically, we we, uh, we do a, uh, uh, like we know the frequency we're looking for. So, very low frequency, we go to we know that something below like 20 hertz or something like that. And then something above, for example, like you know, 900 hertz, 1000 hertz, something like that. Let's say we do hertz like that as well. Um, and then we also do like noise removal, right? So every few seconds, we take a noise from part of the environment, and then we use that to subtract the sound from the signal. So we can remove noise like continuously over time, right? That also works. So much of this stuff, we do certain like you know how we like use EQ, like music, 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 right? We also can do the same thing here. We can do certain frequencies that like you know tune down certain frequencies to make certain things like more balanced out. Yeah, I know that's very big. Long story short, yeah, it's uh, filters, noise removal, and uh, EQ. Yeah. This selection of frequency can be done and then like, mm -hmm. yeah. the question is do you select these like manually? Yeah. So we know that speech only like is really audible between twenty to like let's say uh so like, the higher down there. But basically, let's say twenty two thousand or something like that. Um then anything outside that range can be covered. Right. So these are very like susceptible to low frequency vibration. You know, let's say the I don't know. We actually had this happen in the meeting with the, the aircon was causing a vibration that came into the signal. We just drop things in the middle of the frequency. Otherwise, it looks like that. Like this. Yeah. Great point. So it is, it is very complex case by case data. It really depends on the space. There's no like one side of the That's a good point. Great. Anyone else? Oh, yes. It's a good question. Okay, the question is how, but I don't think where we like put a bunch of points together and like integrate them to get like the audio. Yes, it's a little bit uh, complex in the way that it is. Yeah, so I'm not totally sure. Uh, I forget the details right now. I'm getting a little bit deeper. I think it's about like four to eight points. I think four was four found like a number that I read. So I, I can't answer you like for sure. And four never comes crazy because like 194 is not, you know, 1800 or something. So I, I'm not sure, really, but it wasn't like it wasn't like creating under like 25 or something. Yeah. And that's when you actually got like people who listen to the sound and like say yes to what other person was telling you. So I don't think that like that. Or even anything else? Over time, based on the different needs that we saw the most required. So, our main okay, so our main kind of goal at Deep is to look at when there's a lot of vegetation and it has to have a physical aspect to it. So, we have to have a lot of devices and we don't want to particularly look at. Home IoT. So we are interested more in commercial IoT devices where people interact with systems for business services for international. And we want to see where there are a lot of different kind of devices and kind of people the same role, but they are split and using different protocols. They have different ways of communication. And so that helps our communication. And then we try to see how we can build a unified platform. To connect all them together so that we can power common services. So it's more 
easy and intuitive for uh, users to interact with the environment, easy for a business to add more features to the environment. So, That's a clicker. Yeah. Okay, so a bit of a macro about this. Um, we started out in actually early to late to early 2018, and we've been involved in our three more major times since we launched. We've powered on the three different of the public financial crashes. We've powered 55 million kinds of systems, or very different systems, meaning either types of machines or types of payment systems or application systems. On one end, the physical interface machine, and on the other end, the cloud services that we will use when we interact with the machine. So, we started out actually looking at trying to build something like Square for Southeast Asia, where I'm in the and then I'll go to it. And then we actually moved towards the like, own machines, we moved to human machines. And then, actually, now we're also doing like charging machines, so payments or electric charging or movement and stuff like that. So, some of our kind of track records we did, uh, I think the NUS. Uh, yeah, machine that you have to start. We know that some of the issues on the web, not some of the machine and things like that. Uh, but we've also done stuff like the nature one, and then it's the one where you have your trade and that's it, no mask and stuff like that. And right now we're also kind of looking on looking at unifying the activity to public papers. So either using an RID card, or using a payment terminal, or using a website, and the different kinds of interfaces. But the whole idea is that one of the things for us to not have to use like any of the systems to talk to any of the child patients. So, at the beginning, in late 2017, um, that was when I was in the army and all of a sudden we spoke on the injury to it. And we were kind of just waiting for what to do. Uh, because, you know, when you're in the army, you kind of realize that your brain starts to rot. And so, they want to keep it a bit more active. So on the side, you know, we were just, I was trying to look up everyone in the middle of learning cats out of the uh, I didn't do any going in school, like in JC. So I just picked it up as a thing alongside Army. And I met my co-founder. He is actually more qualified to be a hacker here. He's the kind of person um, that hijacked his school and did a like, server run my computer and stuff like that. So he knew a lot of stuff about hacking. Um, he wrote batch for the and stuff like that. And the idea that we had was we knew that there's every student in Singapore is issued a using card. So when you use that for transport, and you also knew that in secondary school, you need to do body, not so much, that's all you, you have a lot of salt, and you get to 91 students. So you have to spend like 20 minutes to eat food, but you only get 20 minutes to eat, but still it's the morning. So we thought, okay, let's just build a uh, simple thing, kind of proof of concept that allows a small language like, that can do this all the time to accept the link to the race so that we win and we can also try and book uh, or pre order food. So making a food ordering app on a small scale, like this, or small food, like this, that's not hard. What we found was that the hard part was very bad. We thought that we actually had so we were looking around the administration and we realized that in the US was for Square. And what they did was basically say, oh, instead of having to purchase like an expensive payment company and then putting a landline and looking at that power of certain things, they just gave a little money that we found it and then that then we serve them to try to again use the phone app to pay. So that's what we wanted to do. We actually wanted to build our own um, media hardware, so the NFC media, to release my player highest in one or two or four, or four PA and do something like that. And try to connect to the media right? and then have a uh, mobile app to accept the media. So give an interface for uh, the store holder to say, oh, I'm going to spend $10, $5, and then you will command the media. So the very simple, I know, model view to build a place, right? This was when I was talking about learning and when I did one of the not so I think we were learning by a big challenge really for me. But yeah, the reason they have to do one of the challenges for those payments is that they have a lot of bad background in general. Um, yeah, I mean, my manager in the post-art, I was like, oh, it's a great ratio. 
that the exact payments and then send us get bonus the machine. And now you want the machine to pay you can think about that. So you know how hard it is to actually get a machine to say, oh yeah, I understand they wrote all the activity and the steps. So to do that, what we achieved was to find a machine and we actually went out to a few operators, like many machine operators and companies and like, hey, we put up a payment system that accepts cash system and we want to try and apply to many machines and some of them are crazy enough to actually more like another machine to actually kind of test them and pay the lottery. And that's the first time that we kind of had to understand and learn about how it's actually right? So in Android devices, the DLD that we have to chance and it's very well defined how the hardware is actually. But when you talk about the machine, we seem to use analog or you know, kind of very close to the neural head. You have to kind of learn serial robots, right? I don't spot waves and what are other people want to avoid by like zero and stuff like that. Uh, and then you have to get over to the FK, um, X, 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 X. So learning that first, and then also figuring out that there are different phone industry protocols for talking to a machine, like when the machine data is that then I can call my friends and I can send it out. Those are not in API, those are in signals, right? And they have protocol defining what kind of sort of what scene you want. And so at the beginning, we didn't know how to build an entire support, so we went up like how oh, and we found some people maybe that is support. Uh, to the machine, and that happens to be one of the machines that one of the customers or like one of the machine operators who will live with them. So we bought that. And then we published the machine, and then we bought a USB adapter that converted our to this USB micro uh, USB, and we plugged that into the Android device. And then we had to get a virus and then we had to uh, interface it with a web application. So we already had um, a kind of payment application setup, right? And that already had connectivity to the payment system of partners. So what we did was then build a separate application with a phone UI, because the machine UI is different from image UI, right? Machine UI is like selling items, and items of like a lot of description of the goods. Whereas image UI is like here's the price you pay. So we built a bit of machine UI, we built a class to say, oh okay, I don't want to Communicate to the attacker which communicates to the machine, which is connected, which is connected, which is inspection based on the kind of or the same thing like that. And then we build a class to expect communication. And that's the first time that we kind of learned how to use our own um, kind of library, right? build our own internal library. So I'm abstracting the idea of the entire payment app as one simple way. Um, I just need to take it out, share it. And the job of the machine UI is to get the user to the point where, oh, you can go there and you can that. Then you can jump to the thing that. And then the job of the thing that is to say, oh, yeah, you know, you can choose how many characters you want, and then I will show the image that you chose for that bit, and then you can set it. Then you can jump back to the machine UI. So the first time that we all have an external save, because we have an external save from the machine UI, we have greater ability. Ready to do payments and to do collections. And then you also have the connectivity states on payment systems, right? Is, is the company connected? Uh, or is it disconnected? Or is it in the middle of a transaction? And so, based on the uh, cumulative states, so you have a state machine or state machine, right? and then we make a decision on what the user can perform. So, once, you know, as we were doing that, the industry was going to evolve. And in late 2018, my recall that actually the only came from inside of this QR. So instead of having all these different QR codes and applications, the only said, no, one single QR code. And they will combine all of the different payment systems into this QR. What they didn't solve is the fact that we still need to use different apps to pay. Uh, but what they did solve is that if you are a retail merchant, now companies like this, they can actually have a single business app. Where you use that application and you can accept payment from any different kind of wallet, right? It can be yes, it can be Google, it can be OCC, it can be Apple, it doesn't matter. So, much greater than one payment you know, application. And so that was basically what we were trying to do at first, right? I think it's more like the like, payments of phone bill. So it defeated the purpose of what we were building for retail. But unlike a retail store, you can't just go to a machine inside a QR code and then you expect the machine to want to have it. So 
When you put a couple on a bunch of these songs, you can put here, you can actually like, you see it happen, you see the pick, you see the punch, and I think it's good if you see it across the back, and then you go off and then you know, it's down there that it's able to figure out the advocate without having to talk with it. Like, but for machine, you do have to talk with it, just, you know, you kind of get to talk with it, you need an interface. And to make things work, like, there's many new machines in front and they only do it they come from all over the world, you buy from the New America, from Europe, from Japan, from Korea, um, from China, Australia, and stuff like that. And put it so with this, you start to see the application, right? Like the simple mindset, it's all for one purpose, it's for sale of very internet, but the way you achieve it on it. So we thought, okay, we can actually try and build a platform to look at what we've learned from doing the research of the internet. And since we really have a lot of exploration and working on the and we built it together, almost all of them. And one fucking day system that I can go to the machine and plug it in and say, okay, now I can do this. And then we want to do that. And we want to build it to the operator. So that's what we did. So we got to our goals. And it actually made our technical and application tech a lot more complex. Right? All we did was that we had to take. Uh, the payment application, and then we take the machine application, and then we do one step. And on top of that, on many machines, not every many machines have the space on which they follow up. So you need to actually be able to do something in the entire machine, and then that's like your favorite thing that happens. So now there's no longer a potential guarantee that it's too much. So you need a paperless kind of concept where if there is no screen for the user to go and see what I want to do, then you need to basically put in certain patterns or behaviors to say that even a certain state of this machine, given a certain state of even um, process, then you do the next step, right? Without having to get the user to object practice. So, what we did was we looked at what we had to implement on the machine side, and originally it was one machine, and we just went up there and we actually bought the adapter off the shelf. But there was all that kind of market where you could do any kind of machine, right? Like the mechanics machine on the market actually and everything. So we had to do that. Um, and I'm kind of sitting between the two, just about one year plus we had to do cycles. We actually had to build our own computer. We started from a red ball, and then we went to like three days, uh, single layer ball, and then we went to two layer ball, and then we went to four layer. So with that, you know, kind of putting it in a black box, we built that. So now you actually have a hybrid that you work together that's building the series, able to actually convert different machines to code, but not every one of them. And then some machines allow direct serial communication to our different So the same thing that we did for readers, rather than having one reader handle payment and then transaction or payment, you have to you know, split it up into different interfaces, right? On their own set program to say, okay, uh, we define a generic. In the reader interface, and then you implement the developers. And then you do the same thing on the machine. You manage the machine, right? Uh, so that you can control the phone, or the phone, and the phone, and stuff like that. And then you implement it individually, and then you can use each one of the users in the language system, and you get one of the user calls, and you get a two or two of the user calls, and you have to go to the control call, and it's fine. In the end, what matters is that, and the UI there, or whatever, you use the UI. It could be country machines or it could be non country machines at the kind of application logic there. They just see two things, right? Either a machine gets selected or a machine gets started. You don't care if it's a DBS pay or OTP pay or a WeChat 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 you don't have to worry about updates, right? Because you just push it through the loop there. And then you expect the user to say, oh, it's not, and you try to get it in the When you put it into an IoT, that thing is going to be installed in the machine, and it's not there. So, why do you find a bug? What is the user feature, new updates, stuff like that? So, we actually had to build our own launcher app, which takes over the Android uh, home screen. And that one that is kind of using super user and stuff to get access to 
Hobbit of the human in every act. Maybe I could have updated and I've seen the screen, so I was to say, okay, is that a new software update? And uh, so that's how um, the device that here is a new update. Then the application will download it, save it to your software device storage, and then the application will pick it up and launch it and say, oh, okay, there's a new update for this CDK or this new service. And then you will launch the update and then update it. So it's not like that. Actually, we actually built our own framework for running an enhancement session. There's no reason that you need something to always make sure that our application code is running. Otherwise, if there's a crash that happens in the app, because of some automation error or anything that you go up here, if that crashes, there's no user that's expected to update. So then you need something that falls back. And one thing I realized is that a lot of security has been for any that is in the of my um, first in the 90s, just to the street, and the fact that it's a But I did, but they need a good place. So, no good place that I've seen for my day to crash the day. So, all these numbers that came off the picture that said, we need to combine. We had to use the other button things, the Fuji had the other button things for anything to do with the numbers. And we basically stopped using it when we saw it. We just said, okay, I'm just going to write this bar. And then we went to the bar, and then we went to the next uh, uploading task and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's worth doing that on the end of the day. Oh, yeah, it's been going on. What we had to figure out was working on. Uh, yeah, it's been trying to So, that's one of the things we had to cover the meeting. One of the last things that was so important in this. Approach was that you know, do things like an you know, these data systems, you know, machine implementation, they are all transparency, right? And they have to run permanent, they're not like I will old transparency. So, in a regular and that you resign the world that is in the person not to talk about it's done, it's gone, right? It's just that they want to get here. You can't do that in a certain because you need to constantly keep communicating with the payment system and constantly. So then you have to make them solve your interest. They have to be consistent. And how do you get into the communication of that way? So luckily, Android has a communication problem with the the MSQ. And we use that as consistent. So we found a very event-driven um, program because basically each thread would have a message queue. And if it wants to talk to another thread, Let's say uh, the machine says that there's a collection and you need to tell them why. You don't call a question. You don't call for all message. You send a message through the queue to the message queue of that target. And it will pull it out at the event and it will send it through the queue. And so then you have to change your item to the program um, to be able to say, instead of calling a function with parameters, can I actually say, send a message and put data into it so that Whoever on the set knows what the message is from the little bit of the package and then makes it uh, into the token So it's actually a little bit like the uh, remote process. It's very really good process. So you go in the sense that you go up and box signs, so it goes to long after it, and then you figure out how to do it. And once you have that, so we will build it for all the students. On every team, they are not started at first. Any business. But when we were servicing to the building uh, and using our systems for all the students, they also asked us whether it was about news. And that's when we looked at those machines and said, actually, we need to think that much really. They already have um, some devices in them, but they don't have things. So I didn't want to have to look. Another device and you know, you know, you know, it's not enough, right? Why not just take what we built for our own device, extract the necessary software, and then export it? So now it's an SDK. Now the network imports it and then it goes into the web. Right? So then for me, it's the machine, take out the machine code, then the modular of the SDK. And I guess you can do the whole thing with a laptop and export it out. 
So that a manufacturer will change and import the edit to their code and all us to the image. But they handle the machine more. All right, so that's the first time that you get an external library, right? Like learning how to build an SDK after building a demo for talking to any manufacturer about how many reviews are the machine and get that data that's very old and from China and using it and so that's kind of an experience. It is possible to really the the code model and model and the human model and the machine and the design of the or the record of the Now, this approach allowed us to scale because if you are thinking about the design of the machine and the other machine needs an algorithm that is huge, then you need to move at the scale of how fast you can buy your efforts to manufacture the load of the software. But if you are exporting the MNF again, then the speed is as fast as the manufacturer goes. How fast can you get to build on your screen? Because they already have to have them. And with that, that was what enabled us to win the contract around. Because around us, you know, we're going to be one of the machines here with you. And now we're going to change the field here. We're going to take all the In six weeks, we need to have one machine to distribute. Uh, about five to ten So you can't really go back and make building on top of any stream. You can say that you can do that. It's just a lot of things you can do. And so when we did it with the solution of an approach where it's so every day we want, we didn't even care about it. So that's how we move on. The machine can't be built with our container type. But there's a bit of a problem with this approach, which is and I don't put the data, right? So this is our own library tag. And this is my SDK that is smaller. And you can see that there's a lot of code in the data. So maintenance is a problem. Like every time we want to get a fix somewhere, we have to fix it, pass it here, and replicate the fix to that we'll get back in there. And we could easily update our own system. We have our own system and we want to update it right now. But one of the funny things about the handling the matches, or the phone and matches, so that oftentimes they don't have a way to remove the other. They are all machine manufacturer systems. So they traditionally rely on the same work in which the target and US E and press the other market there. So imagine if we can a bug with our SDK or we had a new piece. We could push it up relatively on all of those and push it up in the market. But for a uh, manufacturer, that import the SDK because they have to do something with public students that come to the company before. And then they will have to import it, the new version on their code base, where the other engineers and engineers will send to it. And then they have to test it with the new updates. Then they have to update the app code with the new version of the machine device. And they have to push it down to the customer. The customer is very good at me and they go to the other machines one by one. So that's not a sustainable thing. Like it helps you get the best that okay, it's really not to default, but it can help you get So it's not sustainable. And beyond that, you may think it's a good thing. You know, that means that you do, right? Right now, we're doing that that's not only in the world. And it also on um, Linux or, you know, better by what we did. We are Linux, sorry. In a modern embedded scale, like it's really good to do. Or Windows or Mac OS, like why not the other OS? And why can't we have this hardware limits? Why EV is actually the thing on Mac OS is the channel issue? Right, so the payments that they have to go to the application has something and then have the start or credit card or drop. So we wanted to make our platform even more easy. And we needed to have our own and we wanted to be updatable. So this is where something called the service provider interface came out into the day. The whole goal of STI in Java originally is to allow a single generic input implementation where you define a generic interface. Right? So for example, the data is by the hour and the data. Right? And then it allows for many different implementations of the same service to be loaded around. So this is useful for server, but the contact is actually using something like 
I have more access than my coach. They do that as a student. They do that as a student. For the same purpose, like a language pack or a human language pack. So the whole goal here is what you can do is you take an application of a human language system and give it a pass. And you will have DAOs that represent this implementation of the service. And they both have an implementation of the app. So the one you can pass is that they're separate. All you need to compile that layer is that there's an interface that will handle this stuff. Because the language interface is a function of the That's it. The report is somehow out there too. That's the other time. So when you do that, you're actually allowing what you have something like that. You are able to say, I have an application with the definition that I will do things, but I don't think you're going to do Instead, when you install the application, the application downloads the latest data for these. And then it loads, they might have a new payment version. That's fine. I don't have to change that. I'm going to reinstall that. I just download the new version of that job. And then I use the SDI to reload the interface. And now I see the new version of the same things. So that's what we do. Moving from something that is kind of monolithic, where it's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, it's nice and kind of effective and organized. So okay. And say, you know, let's do the other. Right? Can I say, I use the SDI, I'm going to define specific role, and I will get that role in the world. Right? So we have all the way how to indicate that it does update downloads, it does improvement to communication, it does certain communication platform. Then I have the aims in this case, focus specifically on the interaction, like in the video, and I'm going to show you what so it's really focused on how many dimensions. I have a common thing for it, and all the other things. I expect one means to communicate to a common thing. You can have any dimension of communication at the time. The service is kept. Okay, this is one reason not to end. And then you have uh, implementation of common thing. So you have loaders, which basically take care of loading the interface, right? You have to have something that somehow that, okay, you define the interface and you load in at runtime. And then you put your app. So you run your app logic at uh, the of the class. What you do when the selection, or what you do when the payment is And once you have that, then you allow for a lot of flexibility because you can build different services for different use cases. Right? So originally on our own IoT device, you have that in high management stack, but instead of that now um, on the kind of streamer, you can see like, okay, yes, we have that app logic on top. But all of the logic of how to talk to machines, how to talk to the payment system, how to talk to the server, how to log in, how to start this, and you want. And we can load that at runtime. Right? If I spawn an SDK to the manufacturer, then all I need to say is that actually you don't need a machine server because the manufacturer has a machine server. So I'm just going to load the call and payment server. And if I build my charging station, well, I don't need a machine server here, but I need a charging well, I can stop all of that. The whole world is that the majority of the logic, the stuff that's important to know how to communicate with the market, is still on the dynamic model part. That's the whole idea. So that you might have spot an SDK to an actor, it's just a thing record. That thing record I can change at my time, right? Because it's a loader of the rules and stuff like that. But the logic payments and communicating with the server all the stuff is dynamic. So if I have a new feature, I don't need to talk to the manufacturer. I don't even need to publish anything to uh, the repository. I just build a new app, and then I set the commands to get the machine and say, hey, there's a new service. And then just all of the guys to sit on. And if you don't have to do anything else, just go to the app. So that's the kind of um, core idea of the implementation. Uh, I'll end up today by showing a bit more details about um, the full stack, but yeah, it's basically what has enabled to do, uh, enabled us to do an activity to all the you know, home team industry, factory, and stuff like that. Yeah, so a little bit more detail. Um, interface for the concept behind the developers and the common model, as well as the implementation there. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, so we'll move on to our Q&A session. Uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? So, uh, yeah, I initially meant to say about like, how easy it is, but it's not great. La. But, like, um, when you say that you uh, interface with like, another company, right? How did the payment actually go through? Because, like, it seems like you're like, just using a license, right? Uh, and also, I'm wondering about like, data on like, fancy platform. Yeah, so when we come down, um, the payment industry is a uh, very big industry. Like, it's very complex. I'm going to draw a line right now, but that's all business relationship. But I did it that you may need to call a suit. So they define what it is to, to uh, run on the top of the They define the protocol in a secret key and a secret name and stuff. But they don't necessarily go out there and actually do it apart. Or they don't necessarily go out there and say, you know, each and one that's key to them. They have to do one by the They are companies that are called acquirers. So acquirers are basically especially focused on Allowing merchants to accept him. And we went to an acquirer and we said, like, hey, uh, we got such a so the acquirer to get the acquirer's data, he didn't have to So you have to show that you know, you're a master, you work for the company, you have to send out money, you have to talk about the situation, and stuff like that. But they are also running two services properly. So if you just don't go, um, for internet, they have a content that maybe. But for Visa, Mastercard, um, AMS, we found out that usually it gets the time for them to do like you know, better, 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 better. So not easy. Um, but I guess the choice application they will send, they will put in your code, which is meant to communicate with the NFC chip. So if you want to run an NFC phone, then they will have you know about 100 to 200 few real life stages. Where they will send it to the code, and if you pass, then they say, okay, it's okay, and then you get a, a approval from the scheme scenario manager. So we went to that part, so we didn't do all of that ourselves. So we that. Um, and then we took whatever they used, um, and it was great. And then one of them, when we started out, was not a lot of merchant, so it was kind of really bad. But our argument was that we are using exactly the same code that we did and just shifting where it was. Rather than the code being learning from the code, we just shifted that code to like half of the design of the video. But I think we, I know from the therapy is really fun, but the point is um, we were still messing around with it. I don't want to be a I don't want to bring it again. So today, we work to the instance. Uh, we don't want to go to the same thing to see how it works. It's not really good. There are a lot of companies doing things. It's no longer, it's no longer a rare thing. Um, but these things are not, they don't know what to do with energy. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. And they have a set of problems. And so what we do is we build our layers to say, okay, um, you have these different protocols and we connect them and then the job of the, the door is say okay, if you are on a machine and you want to connect payments you don't have to know how to do specifically command the terminal from the interest you see what you get you don't care that and you say I want payment and then the job of the payment says okay I'm using it for you yeah so it wasn't that you know that it wasn't that you know what we're doing now is to work with people who are using it. And then actually, the third thing is not to do the treatment of the real but to actually give context to them. When you look at what I'm going to do, or 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 what I'm going to do, be like verified and cut you know, like give me a So that's something like doing yourself. So like how does it work? Is there like a sick part or like ready to install it or like to you know, or is it you you can just put it off to the third party now and then the third party can do it? Okay, so the question is how we need to do that. I think we need to add this on. Yeah, so we have to um less on the center of more hierarchy from where they they don't buy any right? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I'll look at this one. I hope the server guy is going to be able to do it. He's not going to be able to do it. He's not going to be able to do it. So, basically, it is kind of like you go from a nice server, you install a local client, that's not how you see the APIs. You can bend it anyway, but typically, the way you use it is the way you use it, that's how it works. So, we need a way for the server to bend the device. We want the device to bend it. So, how do you do that? The first thing you need to do is we have to do something with this. And uh, we realize that we have to do very big numbers. So we have to do the number of percent to be able to do the thing that we do. Number one is this one, and then we sell it. But number two is this one, and then we do the two. But we don't do a lot. But we do run the internet transform here. So you know, we just did it and we still did one thing on set and we had the first situation of we had been written over three days and we got everything out of there. We had not seen any of the problems. There's no effect of the amount. So why is it the other? So we have to do that. The other thing is that they have to get it in one way to the others. Where it's from half the large amount. And so then we took a lot, but we have a lot of money to get a lot of money. The property of the data is technically bad. We don't want the act or the thing that is data ingested. That is on my side. But in the PFF engine, that happens to me. Every time you want to send a whole data ingested to us, and then you do that to me, and then it's something that happens. So like yeah, what did you do? And the other problem, the key problem with Congress is you don't know any something. And the other problem is there's no guarantee of interest delivery. But this is not the guarantee of interest delivery. We need something a few and a two guarantee delivery. We are not for the second movie. We're trying to do the job, but we're trying to do the job. We're probably not going to do the job. Let's get it done. So we decided to work and do because we needed a way to send software, but not the mass thing. I have a new configuration. I need to tell you. So if I have a, let's say a QR thing, you go to QR, you can stick the QR thing on the machine, but you don't have a screen. So the machine doesn't know where I have to be. Like you always can any content of the thing. And the machine will know my machine. That's the way to do the virus. First is you do this before. You just keep calling every second, asking the server that means that you can make it. Or you wait for the server to tell you this thing. And to do that, you need a way to sell that. So you will have to have a certain number of logs and it's just like, I'm not even able to be busy and do it on the same way. And it's just like, I'm going to use the data. So then you just switch that to MDB. For MDB, you can use the word too. There's a the guarantee in the very one that we use. And once you have that, um, it's all that I like in the GDP also the one that we have. So because of those two factors, then we decided to move towards that. You can use it in a 